Good morning all and welcome to the start of an experiment that I've been wanting to do for a couple of years now. Ever since I did my improving clay soil video, I've gotten tons of questions about individual amendments for clay soil. And I wanted to try them all out, but was struggling to find a way to do so in a controlled environment. In my own garden, as you can imagine, there are tons of variables and I use a mixture of a lot of different methods. Then someone recommended a video to me done by Small Garden Quest, where he filled individual five gallon buckets with soil, drilling drainage holes in the bottom of each one, and then adding his individual amendments to test out things like soil quality and drainage. It was a really interesting and well done video, but he didn't cover all of the amendments that I was interested in. And I also wanted to see what actual plants would be like growing in the different amended clay soils. So I decided to set up my own version of that experiment. So I am setting my experiment up like this. I've got nine total grow bags, and these are the uh, fabric, polythene fabric grow bags that are breathable and drained through the fabric. These are 15 gallon. I've got eight different amendments that I'm testing this time, and then a control. I dug up some of the worst clay soil that I could find on my property. And this is an area where I am digging a trench to start a hugel culture bed. So it was a, a good place to dig up a lot of this clay soil. And to give you an idea of my baseline or what I am starting with, I am again in Midwestern Ohio. My average pH is right around 7.0. And I'll also pop some of my base saturation levels up on the screen in case you're in Interested. So these are my readings for things like calcium, magnesium, and sodium. And this will become particularly relevant for one of the amendments that I'm testing out, which I'll explain in a bit. So I want everyone watching this to keep in mind that while you may have clay soil and I have clay soil, clay soils can vary greatly in terms of their mineral content, their makeup. Um, so an amendment that works for me may not work as well for you and vice versa. And I highly recommend to everyone that you get your soil tested at least once so that you have a baseline of what you are working with. So what I am looking for in these tests is kind of a visual and a feel for how soil structure changes with each amendment, drainage or water retention properties, as well as how the plants grow and respond to each individual container here. Now I would have loved to have had pH tested on each of these before and after. Unfortunately, I don't know of a great economical way to get the lab tests done for this many different um, containers of different soil. And to be honest, those at-home soil pH testers are unreliable at best. They might be able to give you an idea of the kind of range that you're in, but as far as getting down to the specifics, I just, I don't trust them. So I'm not even wasting my time doing that. And then in regard to application rates for my amendments, including green sand, gypsum, uh, the liquid lawn aerator and my biochar. I used the application instructions on the manufacturer's packaging, breaking it down as best I could to these very small areas that I'm dealing with. And then for my mushroom compost, my cow manure and my peat, I went with the general assumption that most folks are gonna add a couple of inches to the top of their garden beds and lightly mix that in. So I tried to replicate that in my wheelbarrow when mixing these up, as you will see. I also plan on repeating this process with different amendments. So if there is one that I didn't cover here that you really like to see, be sure to leave a comment below. So the first amendment that I had to test out for curiosity's sake was all purpose or playground sand. I'm not sure how many years back this started, but for a long time, the advice was that if you had clay soil to mix in sand to improve drainage. This seems logical. Sandy soils have almost the exact opposite properties of clay. So it would seem like mixing the two together would result in something more manageable. But the general advice now is to avoid sand. In particular, the all purpose, you'll also see it called playground or fine sand because adding this to clay soil 
can supposedly result in something akin to concrete. Note that this is opposed to horticultural sand, which supposedly can help drainage in clay because of its larger grain size, which allows small little passages for water to get through. Now, I have had less than stellar results with a load of very, very sandy topsoil that I had trucked in to fill some of my beds, but I've never added sand directly to my clay soil. So this will be very, very interesting. According to the University of Illinois Extension, to warrant any kind of real change in clay -y soil structure, you would need to go with a one-to-one -one ratio of clay soil to sand. Now that is an awful lot of sand, and I didn't feel like this was something that most gardeners would realistically do, myself included. So what I ended up using in my grow bag was about a one-to-one -one ratio of weight. So I've got 30 pounds of all-purpose sand and about 30 pounds of clay soil and mixed these together. Now, something to keep in mind is that even if sand of any type, all-purpose or horticultural, improves drainage, sand does nothing to lend any kind of nutrition or fertility to the soil. And as any folks who have dealt with sandy soil know, the water and the nutrition leach out of very sandy soil very, very quickly. So we're ending up with the opposite problem that we have in a lot of clay soils. So we'll see how the soil structure ends up with this all-purpose sand, but even if by some miracle it does improve the structure, it's not going to be an amendment that I recommend simply because of the leaching and the fertility issues. I think there are a lot better alternatives out there. Now, I really wanted to try out horticultural sand, and this differs from all-purpose or playground sand in that the grains are larger and coarser. You'll also see it referred to as sharp, coarse or quartz sand. Now I actually had a really hard time finding any of this. There was none available locally, and I couldn't even find any online from a site that I really trusted. Interestingly, it seems to be very, very popular in the UK, as all of the websites that I came across selling horticultural sand seem to be based out of the UK. And if anyone watching this happens to be from across the pond, can you verify that this is true? Is horticultural sand a popular amendment over where you are gardening? So my plan is to continue to seek some of this out because I really wanna do see the differences between all-purpose and horticultural sand. In the meantime, I decided to use sustainably harvested peat instead. Opting for this because it is a readily available amendment that is still commonly recommended in my area. Peat, according to the International Peatland Society, is the surface organic layer of a soil that consists of partially decomposed organic matter, derived mostly from plant material, which has accumulated under conditions of waterlogging, oxygen deficiency, high acidity, and nutrient deficiency. So what that boils down to is that peat is just the result of organic matter breaking down slowly in very wet, boggy conditions. Now, the pH of peat does typically hover right around 4.4. So if you are already dealing with problematic acidic clay soil, peat is probably not a good option for you. In addition, there are concerns that the overharvest of peat is damaging some sensitive ecosystems. So I was doubly curious to see if any of these other amendments are a better option than using peat. My third tested amendment is green sand, and this is actually an amendment that I had never heard of before. But it was apparently quite popular back in the day. When I asked my mom about it, she said that this was regularly recommended when she was going through the Master Gardeners program. For those of you like me who have never heard of it, green sand is the bottom sediment deposit layer from ancient oceans, which has gone through a weathering process, forming it into a fine sand texture. The greenish color comes from minerals such as iron ore and glauconite. Green sand is supposed to be an amendment that helps condition the soil. Supposedly it works to loosen the earth and is especially good for improving compacted soil or heavy clay. The material goes down into the soil and pushes heavy particles apart, in turn making the soil lighter, which provides room for roots to expand and allows air to circulate in the soil. Now my fourth amendment is a favorite of mine and this is mushroom compost, which is simply the spent growing substrate in which mushrooms are spawned. 
The recipe for mushroom compost varies from producer to producer, but in general it contains things like straw or hay, sometimes peat, gypsum, lime, manure, cottonseed meal, even grape crushings from the winemaking process. These ingredients are composted, pasteurized, and then inoculated with mushroom mycelium. After the mushrooms are harvested, and I think they usually grow two to three batches on the substrate, it is then sold often to gardeners or local landscaping or nursery companies. Now, I have been adding mushroom compost to my own garden beds for about four years now, and that's in addition to a lot of other improvements I'm trying to make, but overall I've been really, really happy with the changes to my soil. Now again, speaking of controlled experiments, I can't really tell if it's the mushroom compost or these other measures that I've been taking. So this will help me see what just the application of the mushroom compost does to my clay soil. And number five is another favorite of mine, and this is aged cow manure. Now, being as we live in Midwestern Ohio and we're surrounded by farms, a lot of dairy farms, um, meat cattle is raised here, there seems to be an endless supply of cow manure. And I've noticed that if you ask an owner of any beautiful old farmhouse garden in this area what their secret is, they will often tell you that it's cow poop. <laughs> And we use this extensively at my mom and dad's place. And we have the farmer just bring in wagon loads and dump it, and we add to the garden beds as necessary. I recommend using aged or composted manure. If you have fresh manure and wanna add it to your beds, just be sure to leave it sit for a good amount of time before planting, as fresh manure can burn tender young plants. Generally adding in the fall and then waiting to the following spring to plant is sufficient time. Or like I said, allow it to sit in a pile and age and compost. The composting process will also help kill off some of those weed seeds, which can still be viable after passing through an animal's digestive tract. Also, if the manure is not coming from your own animals, be sure to talk to your farmer. Some of you may have already heard the horror stories about someone bringing in a load of manure, adding it to their garden, only to have it kill everything in sight. And this is a legitimate concern. Persistent herbicides are sometimes used to treat the pasture where animals forage, or the hay fields that they are fed from. These herbicides can stay viable all the way through the digestive tract and out the other end, taking anywhere from months to years, depending on the conditions to break down in that manure. Meaning that that manure can be toxic to your garden plants. So just better safe than sorry, talk to your local farmer if you're bringing in manure from outside. Number six, so, so, so many folks left comments on my improving clay soil video, just, berating me for leaving gypsum out of my suggestions. Now, based on my specific soil makeup, I have been very hesitant to jump on the gypsum bandwagon. But for the sake of this experiment, I had to include gypsum in the lineup. Now, gypsum, which is calcium sulfate, is claimed to get deep into the soil layers very quickly and provides the needed calcium and sulfur. It supposedly also improves soil structure and drainage. The calcium component does not alter the pH of the soil, and it is therefore the best for soils with high pH level but calcium deficiency. Sounds great, right? The problem is that gypsum really only works this magic in sodic clay soils. Sodic soil has high levels of sodium, but low levels of calcium and magnesium. Gypsum helps by replacing some of those sodium ions with the needed calcium ions, resulting in improved soil structure. But remember those lab soil tests that I showed you earlier? My soil is definitely not sodic and definitely not in need of any additional calcium. But the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see what the gypsum does to my soil in this grow bag. Number seven is a clay busting, soil improving liquid product like clay mend. I ended up using Covington Naturals liquid lawn aerator. What I found is that most of these products work on the same premise, which is using beneficial microbes to break up clay soil structure. According to the manufacturer, this product alleviates the effects of compaction increases nutrient uptake, and promotes healthier plant growth. 
The liquid product contains carbohydrates to fuel microbes, as well as to provide an extra energy boost to plants. It is a liquid biological that contains a synergistic blend of four bacillus strains of bacteria, advanced composition of minerals, essential nutrients, humic acids, and beneficial microbes. Now there are lots of reviews raving online about how this product improved the appearance of their lawn. But I'm wondering if that's more because of the nutrients in the product than the actual aeration effects that are happening. Again, we will see. And finally, biochar. I'll admit, I really, really wanted this one to work. I am fascinated by the concept of biochar. Biochar is a substance obtained by burning biomass. This can be any organic material, often wood, plant residues, manure, or food and agricultural waste in a low oxygen environment. This process converts the carbon in the biomass into a form that resists decay. When it is added to the soil, the carbon can remain sequestered in the soil for centuries. Far from being a modern innovation, this practice is said to have originated in the Amazon basin in pre-Columbian times, with indigenous peoples using a slash and char method to create biochar-rich soil ideal for growing crops. Supposedly, biochar provides your soil with better water retention, higher fertility, and improved structure. I've done some indoor growing of tomatoes and lettuce using biochar mixes and have been really, really pleased with the results. But there has been some research done which shows that biochar may not be equally suited for all soil types. Research done by an assistant professor at Michigan State University has shown that well-drained sandy soils experience experience biochar benefits such as increased soil moisture retention, but that moderately well-drained and or clay soils may not always respond as well. Also, like many products, the quality of biochar can vary vastly depending on production methods and the raw materials used. So I'm very curious to see how this one turns out. And for the final step of the process, this is the one thing I'll admit I did not think this through. So I wanted to plant the same type of vegetable crop in each of these containers to monitor the plant response to these different amendments to see if it made any difference in terms of plant health or growth or vigor, anything like that. But as you can see, we are on the east side of the house and it is quite shady over here due to all of these large trees. I get some morning, early afternoon sun over here, but once the sun gets to the other side of those trees, there's there's no more sun. So this area is solidly partial shade. I had my heart set on doing sweet potatoes in these containers, but we're definitely not getting enough sun over here. Now, at first I thought, oh, I'll just cart these out to the garden where they can get full sun. But as any of you who have ever dealt with clay soil probably know, these are very, very heavy. I'm honestly kind of afraid to try to move them because I know for certain the handles will rip off. I'm also a little worried about ripping the actual bags because most of these are pretty old. I also not only would have to cart them clear out to the garden, but when this is all done, I have to bring them back because the plan is actually to build a hugel culture bed here. So all of this soil is going to get dumped back on top of this area. So in lieu of trying to move these, I'm going to be going with some beets and radishes planted in these containers. It is not the ideal season for them. I typically stick to growing those crops in the spring and in the fall during the cooler weather, but I really, really wanted to plant something in here that not only is gonna put up with partial shade, but is also going to potentially show any ill effects of soil that it doesn't like. And root crops are a pretty good one for that. And then live and learn. When I do my next round of soil amendments, I'm hoping to have them all out in full sun. And be sure to stay tuned for the second half of this experiment. I'll show how the beets and radishes performed, and we're going to dump these containers completely out into a wheelbarrow so that we can get a really good look at how the soil has changed. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. <music>